Coca-Cola Company presents Spotlight Review, starring... So what's going on? What are you doing? Are you drawing? Yeah, I'm working on my Mitford book. Um, uh, I discovered... Uh, I, you probably saw me raving about it on Facebook. I've discovered this English artist um, named uh, Rex Whistler, who was a contemporary of the Mitfords and uh, was part of the, the bright young things of the 1920s. And I'd, I'd seen his name in reading a lot of, of stuff about the Mitfords and the people in their circle, including Cecil Beaton, um, who I don't know if you are you familiar with him? No, but I know the, the Milford sisters. They were like all geniuses, right? What? They were all geniuses, weren't they? Well, they weren't geniuses. Exactly. They just um, they were all very smart and never got any real education outside their home. Uh, and they all went, you know, they, they all went bunch, did a bunch of shit they probably shouldn't have done. <laughs> yeah, they had exceptional lives. One of them was a Nazi, I think, right? One of them was, well, two, basically two of them were Nazis. One was a communist. Uh, one became a successful novelist and one uh, became a, the Duchess of Devonshire. And uh, then there was the dud who just stayed home and cooked. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Amazing. You're doing a book about them? Yeah. They were, I mean, they just, they kind of like... Uh, you know, sort of made these fireworks across, you know, the, the decades in incredible ways that, you know, they went everywhere and met everyone and did everything. Here mm. comes morning espresso. Hey, hey, Wayne. Hey, <laughs> morning hey. espresso. <laughs> you know, we're, we're very civilized around here. You're in South Carolina now? Yep. How's that? That's oh, beautiful. I love it down here. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's real nice. Yeah. yeah. How's how are the people treating you? Uh, very hospitable. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you spent a lot of time in the South, right? Yeah, yeah. I have a whole theory about uh, the way Southerners talk. It's it's like they're all talking baby talk to each other. <laughs> how you doing? Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> like, are you such a cute little thing? Yeah. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> well, God bless you. you. Yeah. Bless your heart. Yeah, bless your heart, and they don't. They don't really. That could mean that could be good or bad. But, but let's talk about what really sucks. Those okay. fucking avatars people are putting up on Facebook. <laughs> those things make me insane. They're so horrible. What is that so, about? Like, I don't. It's they're. Just, I mean, people are bored. You know. I mean, I don't want to harp on it too much because like everyone's just coping whatever way they can. But I just want to say like your your standards are dropping. I mean, this is just like such basic bitch shit. Yeah. You know, they look like like the clip art from a a, a CD ROM that came from a Barbie in 1998. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny because I see it and I'm like, I thought all my friends had better taste than this. Right. I know it's tacky. It's tacky as shit. And, and none of them look like people. No. They, they don't look remotely like anyone. Yeah. And, I don't know. It's just like such a it's such a like lowering of standards, and and also it's offensive to me as a, a live car, breathing cartoonist right. that people like find that acceptable. Computer generated cartooning. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So wait a second. Let me talk about this book you're working on because <laughs> I want to know how many pages are you into on this? Well, uh, so far 51 pages, and I'm doing it in a way I've never worked before in a way I've never worked before where I'm writing it and drawing it at the same time. Whereas like previous to this, I always had like a script worked out for every single comic I ever did. And this time it's like page by page. It's like, I, I've already sort of absorbed it all in my house behind me all about them and, and uh, the people they knew. And, and it's a matter of, of just organizing it into a, a uh, cohesive narrative. Wow. Um, and I, I don't want to be like wrote about it. I don't want anything about it to be like a regular uh, graphic novel biography. I mean, I love I love Peter Bagg's um, bio comics. I, I I think they're great, but it's just I want this to have a lot more um, visual metaphor. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much rich material to work with in terms of uh, what they're their backgrounds were it's and it involves drawing a lot of things I really love to draw that I had never really never allowed myself to like connect with before like um 
these grand kind of uh, frames, these elaborate Baroque frames, uh, they call them cartouches. You know, they're like, you know, all these Rococo flourishes that, um, you know, speak to their backgrounds as their history as coming from uh, the aristocracy. I mean, they were they were themselves extremely minor aristocracy. Their father was a, a baron, which is sort of like on the the low end of, <clears throat> of that stuff. But their family actually was a, like one of the oldest British families, like from like you know way 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 back. But it's not that they even cared about that. It's just as a backdrop to the way their lives had been lived before that. And it's kind of like a bit of Downton Abbey territory where uh, everything's beginning to change. And by the time they're in their 20s, things are changing faster and faster. And it's like their parents had come from this world where even though their, I mean, their father had not expected to be, to inherit this title of being a baron, um, but his older brother died in World War One, and then he inherited this immense hundred room, it's, uh, this th- thousands, thousands of acres, and and this huge Victorian pile that his grand, his father had built, and <clears throat> I mean his father had made all this money being an ambassador. Uh, in Japan and traveling the world over and writing books about Japan and uh, his son David, the the sister's father, David Mitford was like his polar opposite. He he spent time. He was a tea planter in Ceylon. He was in the Boer War. Uh, he he also fought in World War One. I. I mean, he was a badass, but he he was never brought up to learn how to manage that kind of wealth and that kind of estate. And he had horrible horrible. Um, no talent for managing money and and his father had already blown through a bunch of his money to begin with begin with building this hundred room mansion with five grand staircases and and uh digging a half mile long trench so that he could have a, a japanese bubbling brook and yeah you know, so these people like have all this money and no sense of how to really manage it or hold on to it and they just think it's going to go on forever, mm-hmm. like it always had been with the glories of the British Empire. And things are just sinking fast. And the, so these girls had been told there's no money for you. You're going to have to, you know, marry someone rich or find your way. And they all found a way to make a way, you know, a big splash in the world. Mm-hmm. On, you know, I mean, they married, most of them married, um, but they didn't marry for wealth they 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 were you know they were out for adventure in the biggest way wow i mean they really took huge risks and they never they never like backed down they never said i blew it i did the wrong thing it was like they stuck to it even diana who married oswald mosley who was the head of the british union of fascists and a really reviled character they spent the two of them spent three and a half years in prison during world war ii because they were they were suspected of treason and if they suspected you they could just throw you in prison and even after they came out of prison you know in her 80s she was giving interviews you can look them up on youtube diana mosley um and like the interviewer is this british woman who's like asking her in the most polite terms like okay but hitler and jews what about that and she just would not bat- well if we'd known <laughs> i mean she just was not backing down for one second yeah Wow, it'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, they're fascinating. I mean, whether you love them or hate them, and you know, there's like ones, there's the ones you love more, and ones you hate more. And are, are, is this going to be in color, or are you doing um, it? Just well, it's, it's in, um, you know, over easy and customer uh, were in in this uh, shades of green. This one's in blue, actually. Okay. Yeah, I love your color work so much. It's so gorgeous. Oh, thank you. I just felt like like when I work with color, it's like, it takes me 10 times longer because there's 10 times more, you know, there's a zillion more choices to make yeah. with every page. So if I just stick to one tone, yeah. <laughs> it makes it easier to balance it out. I always wonder, do you, on your books, is your uh, color on a different layer? No. Well, it was with with uh, Customer and, and Over Easy because uh, Drawn Quarterly wanted me to do that, but I don't work on a computer. Mm-hmm. So I, you had to do it, you know, mechanically, as they say. Uh, yeah. And I, I really, I really hated that. 
yeah. so much. And it's so much more a pleasure working on one piece of paper now. Yeah. Well, you were light boxing it then, right? And then you just yeah. all yeah. day staring at the light. And then yeah. <laughs> in the dark. I'm not- just guessing. Like, yeah. Oh, could. You know, I didn't even have, I don't even have Photoshop. So it was like, I would just send them wow. the, the separations and they'd assemble them. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that. Damn. And uh, altogether that those two books are probably 600 pages or something. 700. Yeah. 700. Are you going to collect them as one giant paperback <laughs> book? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like that. I'd like it if it was a box set. That would be awesome. Are you done with that story, or are you going to do another volume? No, I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm pretty much done. Yeah. I don't know. I, I never say never, but um, maybe I'll revisit the New York years one of these days. Everyone seems to want me to. Yeah. That was different. That was a whole different thing, though. Yeah, but it's like you know, if if it was a trilogy, it would kind of work because the second book is pretty dark. Yeah. And, like, the second act is always dark, and then you got to do the third act, which is like victorious. You know. And I was victorious. I went to New York and I, and uh, I became one of those people that actually made money making comics. So when you were in New York, is that when you did like the Valley Girls guy? Yeah. Like, yeah. But that's such a California book, though. You know? Well, you know, I'm from San Diego, so I had been doing comics for the Village Voice, and this editor from uh, Dell Books uh, asked me out for lunch, and um, I was, you know, trying to keep him amused with imitations of people I'd gone to high school with who were like these stone surfers who were like, hey, man, we ought to go to the beach, man, catch some waves. And they were like, just such idiots. I just hated them. <laughs> <laughs> and and then he said well we want to do this book about valley girls and i was like what's that and i hadn't even heard the song uh, by frank zappa for people who don't know and his daughter who was then like 13 or 14 moon unit zappa <clears throat> did the song making fun of her uh san fernando valley classmates who you know had this whole kind of slang worked out and i i mean i didn't even have a record player at that point i had to buy the record go to a friend's house put it on the turntable, listen to it and go, oh yeah, that, I can do that. Yeah. So then I, I went back out to LA and drove around and went to the Sherman Oaks Galleria where I was on an elevator escalator behind these two teenage girls who were like, oh my God, you know what movie we should go see? And the other one says, no, what? We should go see Bambi. Oh my God, that's my favorite movie in the whole world. And I was like tapping them on the shoulder and buying them Cokes in the food court and milking them for everything. <laughs> <laughs> How many? Well, was that like uh, one book, or was that like a series of books? Oh, it was about, just one. Oh, okay. But it was a pretty successful book. Yeah, right? I mean, I like like dashed it off in six weeks, and then it was like I was on a you know, fifteen city book tour, and you know, and the New York Times bestseller list, and yeah, like, paid off my student loan. <laughs> Humor books was a big thing back then. Yeah, there were. I rode that wave as long as I could. Yeah, that's what I'd be doing too. Gordon wrote it all the way to shore. <laughs> I did I like five, five humor books. Maybe that'll come back. That kind Maybe of, it will. Who knows? Joking Let humor. Pay for them? <laughs> yeah. And then was that before you worked a? You did stuff for National Lampoon or not? Yeah, that was like at the same time. I was. I actually was had been had sold a few cartoons to the Lampoon while I was still a waitress in Oakland, which was like triumph. The thought of New York terrified me. I didn't know anyone there. I, you know, it was like, it was, might as well have been the moon. But, you know, she said, oh, you can stay with me. And I was like, I was on it. When you moved to California, it was in the 80s or something? Or what? Yeah, 80, 82. And you worked on Pee Wee's Playhouse or not? Oh, well, Wayne, my husband, Wayne, was a production designer on Pee Wee's Playhouse and a puppeteer. And I actually um, wrote an episode uh, in the second season or was it the third season, with, with Lynn Stewart, who is Missy Vaughn, um, called Reborella. Um, and it, it ruined me for writing for Hollywood because <laughs> that they just they took our script and they shot it. Yeah, wow. <laughs> they just shot it. I was like, oh, great, that's the way it works. <laughs> I was like really uh, <laughs> sad when I found out that that's not the way it works. When you get back into comics, is it like a rude awakening to see how comics have changed? Like how little money there is left. Yeah, in- it's horrifying. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, I was used to getting paid. Yeah, and then all of a sudden so, it's like it's a, just a wasteland, and you're like, what happened here? But, yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's like I, you know, I, uh, we moved to LA in 1990. I had two children and one day I looked up and it was all gone. You know, it's like I had to like claw my way back up off the, yeah. the uh, at the, from the bottom of the cliff. Yeah, yeah. It's like Mark Newgarden said this thing on, on this post I made on Facebook this morning about how like you work really hard to establish yourself in an industry but then, like, before you know it, the people that have let you in, it's the, they leave, and then it's, like, a new group of people yeah. come in. And then you have to start all over again. And but like, then also, magazines are just gone. Yeah. You know? Print is gone. <laughs> yeah, but even to get your books written about, it's, like, so impossible. Just, like, any just get, like somebody who runs a blog, like, write about this book I spent years working on, you know? Well, that's where John and Quarterly is really good at that promoting their their books and so they're like tapped into that whole network and they take care of that so that's that's a big relief i only used an agent once and that was for the book that i'm working on now and uh, what's that i'm working on this book about um the the founding of the mormon church like where that oh, where yeah that sounds fascinating Joseph smith and stuff yeah i've been working on it now for a few years and like now my um I kind of, like when I first started doing it for the first couple of years, I was like, yeah, and I was reading all these books. And now I'm like slugging along. I'm like in the 250s and I'm just like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you must have read Under the Banner of Heaven, right? Oh, yeah. That was like one of the first things that somebody sent me. Yeah. Well, I was raised in the church, so that's like my personal reason for. Yeah, sure. But like, yeah, and then I've just been reading all these, like, I, like, like similar to you, I have a big stack of books about Joseph Smith. And I just like have been so immersed in it. And at this point, it's like I've done most of the work and my enthusiasm for working on it. It's like started to wane because I now I'm like my mind is starting to wander into other projects. Like I want to do other stuff. And so now it's just tough. That's how it goes. This is where you're going to be this time next year. You're going to be like, all right, enough of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they told me that I had to, to cap it off at 300 pages. So I can't go beyond that. I could. I could just keep going. There's just so much stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's another thing, right? You have to figure out how much do I write about? How much of this yeah. story is necessary? I'm just sort of like staggering, like bumping around in the dark, man. <laughs> do you draw this book at 100%? Um, uh, it's a little bigger, I think. You drew it? Wait, wait, the original art is a little bit bigger? Yeah. That's one of the things I like about your art is that it's pared down. Like you know exactly what details to include in the in the drawing and what to leave out. I'm glad it seems that way. <laughs> I don't always. Sometimes like I get just. I mean, I loved drawing the restaurant interior. That was like my comfort zone. I could like, I could draw that with my eyes closed. I knew what everything looked like. Um, and also I, I I had originally written the whole thing as a conventional piece of fiction. Um, and and my agent couldn't sell it as you know uh, that and I finally had to break down and admit to myself that it wanted to be a graphic novel which I thought before was like that's crazy no one could ever do that much and there's some people that pick up the second one without knowing about the first which makes me a little nuts but it, I guess they work independent of one another I, I can't quite see it but anyway um I mean I I had it, it was in my head so long I knew exactly what everything looked like before I ever put pen, you know, started drawing it. Um, but, um, you know, I it's like, so drawing the restaurant interior and the, the different characters was fine, but uh, exteriors, architecture, cars, those were challenges for me. One of the Hernandez brothers admitted he hated drawing cars. I, I can't remember which one, <laughs> but I was like, oh, thank you. You know, like I had this, the, my first car, car, which is in the book, was a 1969 Plymouth Satellite, which was this behemoth. It was like a, a muscle car and drag. You know, it's like a, 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 it had like a huge engine and I'd be like, a, you know, idling at this at the stoplight and some guy would roll up beside me and go, damn, that car's bad. And I'm like, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I had a flowered vinyl roof and, and matching interior. I had been my mother's best friend's mother's car. And it was like once, you know, it was like I finally learned to drive when I was 23. And it was like, you know, my parents were like, OK, now you're going to get a car and it's going to be this car. And I'm like, OK. I had to, like, learn how to draw that car. And I finally had to, you know, you just have to make your peace with it. Um, you know, you've got to make it look convincing. Like, 
you know, I, 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 there's people I see now who are like trying to make comics and are like, I, the first thing you notice is when people can't draw hands or feet, you know, woodshed that, that hand and, and foot drawing business. Cause you know, you can't, you can't get along without it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. There's a lot of comics where it's just talking heads. Yeah. That's, I know, that, that's no fun. Yeah. That's a big, uh, I see that a lot. That's it's like, it's too easy. And I always try and stop myself. Cause it's like, so much of the book I'm working on is just the exposition's all done through dialogue. And so I'm just like, all right, how do I make this interesting? So it's not just like yeah. this head, then this head, then this head, right. you know. Do you think uh, uh, that like humor is from uh, unhappy childhood? Do you think that's true? Do you think people that had a happy childhood can be funny? Uh, I really had a pretty happy childhood, so. Um, so not, so it's not. Uh, necessarily. Yeah. Do you I mean, use. I don't, uh, I don't I don't subscribe to that whole theory that you have to, to as a, a as a humor writer or a humorist or a comedian or a cartoonist that you have to uh, like you have to have this neurotic inner life of of complete misery, and I think that's something that a lot of male cartoonists have subscribed to uh, to emulate Crumb. They think they have to be miserable in that way. Uh, mm-hmm. and and I mean, I watch, I, I uh, became acquainted with, with Crumb through Justin um, Green and uh, Bob Armstrong um, in, the, in the Bay Area when I was um, living in Oakland. And um, I could see that his, his um, counterparts, his, uh, his contemporaries, the people around him, these guys, they were all trying to be like him, which meant that you had to act like you were miserable all the time. Yeah. And, and that you couldn't sell out. You know, I mean, I, I totally, I totally admire Crumb, who never sold out and stuck to his guns. And he's like a, he's a, you know, you, he has political, he, he has, there's issues, definitely, mm-hmm. but he's, he's a brilliant artist. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, that's, you know, that's fine for him, that worked for him, but like, I, you know, I hear them talking like, yo, man, I would never sell out, man. Like, what's the point? And I'm like, no, you know, I'm tired of working in a restaurant and I'll do some illustration and some commercial work. And that doesn't bother me because it's better than working in a restaurant. <laughs> I love your autobiographical stuff so much. That's a rich mind to 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 uh, get into. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's misery. I mean, that's that goes back to like uh, like I feel like a lot of my siblings and myself and maybe even my father's kind of wacky too. Like we all have crazy senses of humor because the, the, it was such a turbulent fucking irresponsible mess of my childhood. And like I deal with things that are uncomfortable now is I joke and laugh about them. So I get, I get into a lot of awkward situations because of that where like somebody's trying to really tell me it's about something horrible that happened to them. And I I just can't, I just start laughing because it's just like, it's uncomfortable. (laughs) But all that stuff, it's like that's how we like dealt with things. Like yeah. we used Sounds to like walk around our house with lot. discomfort. Yeah. So I don't know. Like our car, when I was growing up, the, my family's car, the floors were rusted through, so you could see the street pass by. Wow. So we had a piece of wood on the floor, and we used to call like our Flintstones car and just start laughing <laughs> about. <it. laughs> but yeah, I don't know. So that, I mean, all that stuff, like definitely colored my uh, sense of humor and so all the like humor books that I did so far like I did after working a shift at a Panera Bread you know so I was just like super depressed and poor and I just had so much like anxiety that I just come home and it all come out in like really funny comic pages and stuff so I don't know if I can write funny anymore now I'm not funny <laughs> things are <laughs> I knew that over easy and customers always write the same story but I didn't know that it was all like written out as a novel first yeah like the material that was in two books was one book originally it's pretty amazing yeah i mean it was it happened that way because um my kids were still small when i pretty small when i got and they were in grade school when i when i finally got the drawn quarterly to agree to publish it and and uh so i was having a hard time like just getting started and, and managing my time because I had two children at home and um, Chris Oliveros would call me up and say, well, you know, when do you think this is going to be done? And I'd be like, just on the phone, like, <laughs> and then 
<laughs> he said, Let, let's break it. Let's break it into two parts. So that made it more manageable. Well, was it going to be a, like a 700 page graphic novel at first? Well, I mean, it just it just kind of came out the way it came out. I wasn't really uh, I didn't have anything um, mapped out in terms of the length. It was just like it, I was really grateful that I had the freedom to just, uh, you know, they allowed me to just let it be as long as it wanted to be. Maybe what, that's why this time they said 300 pages. Are you keeping sketchbooks while you were um, raising your kids? No, no, I just, I didn't really have time for that. I mean, every once in a while we'd go, well, we, we did um, regularly go to the LA farmer's market on uh, certain Fairfax and, and uh, do what I call drawing and donuts where we'd, we'd sit and it's a great place to go sketch because there's a lot of funny looking tourists and funny looking old people who sit still for a long time. Uh, so, uh, and it's, and, and, and then you've got the donuts. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so we'd go there and so I, you know, I did a little bit, but not like, um, I just didn't have the, the time or the energy to, uh, to focus on, on that while, you know, I was raising the kids. I mean, I was doing, I was, once they were in grade school, I was starting to do comics like for the LA Times. So I have a body of work of stuff I did for the LA Times, which is which is good. Um, unfortunately, they were they were publishing them, uh, and then, you know the newspaper reproduction is not that great, and they could really only be about like seven by nine. So you had like a total of like maybe you know if you were lucky nine panels to work with, wow. but uh, and so you like really had to like. Re you know, reduce and reduce and reduce things down, you know, down to like a, uh, you distill things down to an essence, which is one way to work. But uh, the glory of, of working on Over Easy and Customer was that I, I got to throw all of that out the window and just let it tell me how long it wanted to be, which is really great. And then I, you know, started doing web comics for them, uh, which is much more free because, you know, there's no, there's really no uh, limit of space. So like I did this cartoon about um, going to Zsa Zsa Gabor's uh, auction at her house in Beverly Hills. And that was just like a gift, a pretty gift with a big bow wrapped up just for me. It was like, it just wrote itself. It was magnificent. And her, like Zsa Zsa Gabor's sleazy, sleazy husband was there. And and I was you know allowed to interview him and like the publicist said you have 30 minutes and he just kept babbling on and on and on it was like just rich he was such a creep and he had this comic German accent and which is apparently the the last accent on earth you're allowed to still make fun of oh I, that's this so funny I you know what's interesting I just realized I know her because of the Pee Wee's Playhouse Christmas special. And she she comes on. Yeah, she comes on her and her part is really short because she couldn't even deliver her lines. And they finally had to just cut her down to like, hello, Pee Wee, goodbye, Pee Wee. Yeah, that's right. And then the, the the cow has like one of those like fur things around them too, and like some necklaces and stuff. And then I don't know. We used to like, we used to watch that special like every year for Christmas. I Is bought like... beads for the for the Countess's necklace uh, on St. Mark's Place myself. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> well, Wayne was building the, the cow puppets, so yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. That's cool. So uh, you're not going to collect any of those comics? I'd do that if, if you know, someone offered me the opportunity, yeah. Yeah, that should be done. You should collect all that stuff. All your work should be collected and then re-released in, like, slipcase editions and, like, the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then a, and then a, a gold-plated Rolls Royce should roll up to my door with a satchel <laughs> full of bills. Is it hard to get back into cartooning if you haven't like if you haven't been working on it? Is it or is it just like natural? No, every, every time I I go without working for a a day, it takes me like another day to get sort of back into it. Like if, if I haven't been working on for a while it takes at least three days of me sitting at my desk fidgeting and fidgeting before i yeah. get something going you know it's like you just have to get this momentum you know i always think about this thing that kim deitch said which was that when he comes when he knows he's nearing the end of one book he starts the next book he's constantly working on something because he knows at his age like momentum is the most precious thing so keep it 
Uh, that's pretty good advice. You know? Yeah. It's easy to just stop and go chill out. Like my my partner Amy's always like, after you finish this book, we're gonna go on vacation. You know, you're not gonna draw anymore. And like I'm like, I want to keep drawing. I don't, I don't want to like stop and go on vacation. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the other another good bit of advice is to just you know get comfortable with discomfort. You know, get yeah. used to the idea that you're gonna draw stuff that you hate and it's gonna make you want to hate yourself and stop, but you just keep going anyway. A drawing demon and a drawing angel on either shoulder, you know, constantly uh -huh. in my ears. <laughs> you yeah. suck. You think you can draw? You can't draw. Like, no, that's really pretty good. You should keep going. So you go to like um, Goodreads.com and see what people like, say. I, try, I really, I try not to. Uh, there was one that I, I, I read and then I, I responded to, and then the Goodreads people said oh, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Who <laughs> from some young woman who, who called me. Um, 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 what's the word everyone loves now? Uh, privileged. I was like a privileged, w rich white girl working in a restaurant. Uh, no, I wasn't. <laughs> was a young woman on my own with a job and, you know, no money coming from any other source. Yeah. So I had to work at a job. <laughs> what, how did your both your kids become artists? Did you encourage them or is that a natural thing? Yeah, we couldn't encourage. I mean, like, I wouldn't even know how to encourage them to be a doctor. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> that works. Like, you want to do that? You're on your own. I can't help you. Like, that's a nice, that's a nice uh, ambition. But, uh, and I, um, I would be all for it. But I, like, I know nothing about science or math. And, uh, I mean, all we've ever been able to show them is, is how to do what we do. Mm. And then it's just natural. Yeah. Uh, and my dad was an amateur cartoonist, so I kind of grew up with like knowing like at least one grown up could draw. I, I mean, I, and then if he wasn't around, I'd try to get my mom to draw me something and she couldn't and I'd just be disgusted. <laughs> also at school when teachers would start at the blackboard and they'd draw a stick figure, I'd just be enraged. My dad could draw one thing and that was that Kilroy is here thing. Oh, the nose. Everyone could draw that. Yeah, I'll, but as a kid, I thought that was amazing. I was like, yeah. oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> So you you would have like a household where everyone would be in a separate room making something? Yeah. And it's all good. I mean, Woody is like an amazing artist. Yeah. Lulu is too. I haven't seen uh, Lulu's work before. Is it like, is it paintings or? Um, well, she does she does her own work, which is um, kind of multimedia and very interesting. Um, uh, and she has a site for that. She has an Instagram for that. And then she has an Instagram for uh, her um, um she she does um portraits for for money you know like it's not like what she ch like would do she's really really good at it i mean they're beautiful at, but she has this other stuff that she likes to do so it's called i will pay i will paint i will paint your pet so she does human and portraits and so she's you know she's got a pretty good gig doing those and she also works she's working now as an assistant to uh different artists and um so she's got that going on woody just finished illustrating a, a children's book for dave eggers with uh oh. chronicle books that's coming out in the fall it's wow really um have you ever been published by the new yorker before um well i had back in the 90s i had one cartoon in the new yorker they did an issue on hollywood and um I, it was a comic strip um about uh it was a Oh, when was it? It was like must have been about 1998 or so, and um, things were sort of depressed in Hollywood for whatever reason. And um, I was asking people who had been working in Hollywood uh, what they were doing to get by. Um, you know, like there was an actor who was doing like um, being a, a phone psychic. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, there were, um, you know, comedy writers who were writing for really bad uh, reality shows, which were just coming in at that point. Um, and, uh, and, you know, some editor who was asked to edit some piece of garbage. So it's, that was what that it was. And that was like, that was the only thing I had in the New Yorker for ever and ever. And then um, lately I, I published stuff on, on the New Yorker online. But mm -hmm. as you know, that doesn't pay very well at all. 
it's it's good for I mean it is good for exposure and and you know if you if you just say the words New Yorker it's like suddenly you have this like golden sheen around you. Yeah, it's on your gravestone when you die. <laughs> but it is kind of shameful that they pay their online uh, artists so poorly. Yeah, well you, you were not you weren't a mini comic artist were you? No, I never really did that. I mean my version of mini comics is just online comics. Oh, well, I thought that you met. I assume that you met Matt Groening from like mini com- the mini comics world or something, and then no, no, he was already in the LA Weekly. Oh, that's right. Oh, okay. And you were doing stuff around that same time too in the LA Weekly, or not? No, no. I, I actually we met him through Gary Panter, um, who worked oh. on Pee Wee, of course. All right, yeah. I gotta let you, I gotta let you go, Mimi, because I've taken an hour of your time, and I think a storm is about to start here, so it might get kind of crazy around here. Okay. I really appreciate that you gave me your time to to talk. Oh, sure. It's always wonderful to talk to you.